Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Holden's 11. We've got a terrific guest today, today's special guest, my pal and comic creator, Steve Ricketts. Welcome, Steve. Thanks, Tim. Good to be here. Um, thank you for inviting me to your show. Man, I'm so excited to have you because uh, this is one of my favorite topics, and I know it's one of yours, too. Um, today's topic, the top 11 Golden Age comic book covers. Awesome. I, I'm a really big fan of Golden Age comics, and uh, the, the, even though it's getting to the point where you can't afford them anymore, uh, yeah, I mean, the Golden Age, are, that's that's where it all started, and uh, I, I really love them a lot. Yeah, and I'm so glad you said that, because one of the things we're doing today is, you know, they're not necessarily the most valuable ones, although there's some pretty valuable ones on this list, but just the ones that you and I kind of loved and we kind of chatted about, and it, you could say that sort of some of these have influenced your work. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I I, I really like uh, people who do the homage covers and who go back to the the very beginning of comics and do the... Uh, the golden age stuff that, yeah. that's that's always fun yeah i totally agree 100 percent. and you know the homage covers remember when they started they were kind of rare right oh yeah yeah the, they it, you rarely see one and i mean even some people like uh uh todd mcfarlane did uh, homage to himself from comic uh from spider-man 300 to spider-man 301 uh, yeah. another one was uh I mean, he did three almost in the same month. Uh, I can't remember the Hulk, the Hulk 268, something like that. Right, right. Maybe I'm wrong. I, they're, they're, the number's wrong. But he did a Hulk cover the same month as he did Spider-Man 301. And I remember it was that. like, boom, boom, boom. There's three covers all the same. And I was going to say, and nowadays, it's almost, you're almost expected to have an homage cover, uh, particularly if you're doing one of these modern Kickstarters like you are right now. Yeah, um, and I, I felt that I the first issue I wanted to do a couple of homage covers, and uh, they're I think they're fun, and I think they uh, the Golden Age stuff is the they're long gone, but their influence is still here a hundred almost a hundred years later. It's the that's the foundation of comics, right? The foundation of comics, well said, and and I think too that you always pick up customers from that. And what I mean by that is that some people collect just the homage covers. So if you have, like, for example, uh, one of these in my most recent campaign, we did the Star Wars Episode Four poster. And we picked up a couple of customers who maybe might not even necessarily like my book, but they see a Star Wars cover. Well, I got to have that for my Star Wars collection. Oh, now. I totally understand that. Which, and by the way, I'm not uh, disparaging that in any way because I'm the same way. I'm a collector myself. So yeah. I can Everybody see, collects what they collect. That's, they that's do, right? The there's no, there's no wrong way to do it. Nope, absolutely not. If we all did it the same, it'd be a crowded marketplace. Yeah, <laughs> in, in, a, in a more boring world too. So. In a boring world. Well, without further delay, man, let's launch right into our list. I'm really excited to get to this because there's some great books here, and I know yeah. you have a great deal of expertise in this subject, and I, I can't wait to talk about them. Let's start with number eleven, Famous Funnies two twelve. That's from 1934 by the legendary Frank Frazetta. What can you tell us about this one? Steve? Legendary Frank Frazetta. There, there can't be a list talking about good golden age or great golden age without having a Frank Frazetta on it. That's for sure. He is the, he's the king. He's the king of comics. He's the king of art, in my opinion. Well, in this one, you got a great layout too. It's the flying saucer and the, uh, the uh, beautiful woman being tossed out of the flying saucer. Yeah. Which I just love the layout. And, you know, here it is. What is that? It's 90 years later, all but, and still yeah. cool, you know? Well, I mean, even, even uh, George Lucas talks about all the influence that he had for Star Wars. It was all came back to uh, Frank Frazetta. I mean, if Frank oh, no Frazetta thing. hadn't been an artist, George Lucas wouldn't have had all the cool stuff in Star Wars. I Isn't mean, that something? I didn't yeah, know that. That's yeah. interesting. Wow. So would you say that uh, Star Wars was an, I mean, speaking of Star Wars, would you say that was an influence on your work? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. No doubt about it. I'm, I am a total sci-fi nut, a geek. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, this, the science fiction stuff's where my, I guess my love started. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm exactly the same way. I, I, I'll tell anybody that will listen to me, I can remember the being in that theater and waiting in line, by the way, because oh, there was yeah. a little bit of a buzz around it. And uh, the, it was, and I already had liked movies, you understand, but the experience, it was just like anything, unlike anything that had been done. And we're lucky to have been alive then. Yeah, because man. That, you, you can't explain to people what that was like waiting in line to see Star Wars for the first time. It's just right. another and thing. Do you remember, too, it was like a thing that you would brag about was the number of times that you had seen Star Wars. Oh, yeah. Like, oh, yeah. I, I saw Star Wars seven <laughs> times. Well, I saw it 11 times. It's kind of meaningless now in the age of streaming. Yeah, yeah. See things People don't right. understand that, Tim. Whenever the movie would come out in the theaters, you might not see that movie again for five years because – the, the only way you'd ever see it again is once it left a the theater would be if it came on television, you'd usually get it on television about a year later. And even yeah. then you might only see it once and never see it again. There's movies I saw in my childhood that I've never seen again to this day. Right, right. And, you know, I love talking to you, Steve, because we have so many shared experiences of the cultural okay. zeitgeist i'm not going to get too far off topic but i also remember you're a gargoyles fan. oh my gosh animated show but the spooky movie from the, the 1970s bernie casey was bernie the casey. Gargoyle. <laughs> <laughs> well yeah. uh make, make a mental note here we will uh, our next list will will work uh, gargoyles onto our list <laughs> hey man yeah that that movie tim tim that movie terrified me when i was a kid i can't tell you I saw that movie came on on the late show, probably I saw it three or four times when I was a kid, yeah. but every time I was terrified of that. Yes. Same here, man. And oh. uh, the makeup effects, although they don't necessarily hold up too well today, but at the time for the seventies, well ahead of their time. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I agree with you there. Yeah. That I can't imagine the, the time that it took to put all that makeup on them <laughs> yeah a, a great script too i thought i've always been a script guy and i still you enjoy know. the script for gargoyles yeah i'm well, still afraid to watch it <laughs> <laughs> well you know it occasionally pops up on tubi which is yeah. that app of the free uh, tv shows and yeah the, the, the thing that's great about that channel is they occasionally get some ringers like they'll get some good movies that you didn't expect yeah well i'm i'm lying by the way i have it on dvd <laughs> oh nice yeah awesome I, I'm a fan of DVDs. You know, oh, yeah. I, I don't know how they ever talked us into moving away from physical media because now that we stream everything, you know, no. the, the quality's not as good. I, I also, I'm a guy who I like those extra features where they, I do. they talk to the director or maybe show you a little production art. Stuff Absolutely. Like yeah. I like, so, I like the voiceover stuff. So bring back the DVD. I say, I, I totally agree with you. So I think we can both agree here that for number 11, the entire world of sci-fi and comics, we owe a huge debt to Frank Frazetta for his Absolutely. visionary work. Absolutely. He, he, his visuals uh, are still relevant to this day and, yeah. and still influ influential to this day. Yeah, totally agree. Well, let's change it up just a hair. Our next number, number 10, Tales from the Crypt 28. That's from 1952 by Al Feldstein. Uh, I love Tales from the Crypt, and I love all those uh, early horror books. There's not many of those early books that I don't like, but the shocking covers that they came up with, you know, it's one of the reasons why they had the, the code to begin with. And can you tell oh, us yeah. a little bit? Tell us a little bit about that, Steve. Oh, man. It, it, if there's no wrong answer putting an EC comic on the top anything list for the golden age you could we could make a top 11 golden age or a top 11 ec covers i mean and yeah. we'd have a hard time picking that 11. one yeah <laughs> for sure man for sure yeah i you, i mean you look at the uh the artist pool that they had at ec comics there was not a weak link a weak link man everybody was hard hitters they were right. just solid that was such a solid group of people well and there's a great series that they released and of course these have been reprinted many times but they it made a great series of hard covers of these collected oh, yeah. issues and that's really how i've experienced most of them because as you know the issues oh. themselves are very unaffordable at this point yeah but, but yeah. they there's some great comments in there to the effect of there was really no cover that was too shocking that was what they were going for and yeah. i admire that that you know they kind of said to themselves let's go against every social norm yeah and really just try and 
shock well, the pants off everyone and to be honest it was because of ec comics and what they did that they came out with the comics code they the ec comics pushed the envelope to the edge and caused this uh, giant uproar of people that were you know the the kids are being uh, mentally uh, right. destroyed by these horrible violent comics sure and hey maybe they were because these this was cool stuff <laughs> <laughs> well, we turned out okay yeah yeah I think but so. yeah there was they were trying to prove the link between comics and juvenile delinquency in those yep, days yep yep well you know i don't know if there was any correlation but the d comics were amazing <laughs> <laughs> you got that right man i gotta say i agree with you on that one well without further delay let's move on to number seven this is uh the steve this is one of your picks so i'd like to hear more from you this, this is my this might be one of my favorite comic covers in, in history i okay, love well, this cover so much I, I will slap the image up here on the feed this is number nine fantastic comics number three that's from 1940 by lou fine so yep. uh tell us a little bit about this one okay my going back to my love for science fiction hey robot covers what's better than robot covers how about a bunch of robots how about giant robots how about a just total destruction and mayhem buses being uh, held up in the air people falling out. i mean man what's what is not to love with this cover yeah yeah that it's a good one and you know i'm a robot fan myself people have uh, joked with me many times about i all my books that i write and i had just had number 10 come out every one features a robot in some way oh yeah and you mentioned the the comics code authority and you know the emblem that they put on the covers i don't know if you ever noticed but we homage that emblem as well and it's it's the three lc the three laws compliant all of our yeah. books are three laws compliant which yeah. is a little bit of a nod to isaac asimov but you know to me the robots were always more interesting than the vampires and the werewolves by the way i loved those things uh you know that's of course the subject for another list i've always loved horror movies but science fiction just always rang true to me and there was something about how near it was and how genuine it was and I, i'm still fascinated by it today oh, and yeah. i think that was a great pick and you know i'm happy to see that one made our list yeah me too i love this i love this so much it's just it's classic classic comic covers i, I, I gotta ask you do you have a copy of that one no, I wish I did. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that one's this is always one of those books that were, you know, back when it was like two or three hundred bucks. It's like, ah, that's you know, it's just a little more than I want to spend. And then it gets up to two or three thousand dollars and it's like, ah, it's a little more than I want to spend. And yeah, it ain't happening for me. <laughs> well, and you know, uh Steve, I'm so thrilled to, to talk to you. And I think your new book looks absolutely terrific. And I'm gonna make a statement here, and it's true of most of us comic collectors and creators which is I'm a comic collector myself. And about five years ago, I made the jump into the water of making my own comics. And now instead of collecting, I spend all my money on production and pages. And unless I miss my guess, I think Steve Ricketts is going to be right there with us. Yeah. Yeah. It's, That's, it, that is exactly what I, I can't, I can't stress enough how much uh, love you have to have to be a comic creator. You, you, it, it takes all of your uh, time and all of your uh, hard-earned money to, to make <laughs> these things happen. But you know what? It's such a uh, it's such a uh, fun thing to do, and it makes you feel good at the end of the day. Because hey, I created that, you know. Right. It's it's the uh, the joy of creativity is unlike any other of the experience of human life. I think. Totally agree totally agree with you tim so and speaking of creativity uh and this one ties right into your book as well steve and this is number eight it's mask number two that's from 1945 uh by lb cole yeah and um I, i'm gonna let you take this one tell us a little bit about the cover and specifically why i know that in your kickstarter you've designed an homage based on this cover i did indeed this is one of those covers that not a lot of the mainstream or the the uh, newer collectors know about um, this cover. LB Cole is such, uh, he's a legend, but he's still an underrated, an under, underappreciated legend. I mean, this guy, he, at, at, in the time of the golden age, he was doing some amazing work and he had such a, he used a palette of these primary colors on his, right. on his work. 
and it was just it, it's like uh, it's like he's like one of the fine artists of the golden age he he had such beautiful brushwork and he had these just pop these colors that pop off the page and uh, i did an homage of this cover for my my new comic uh ripped that i uh, just started my kickstarter yeah it, it looks great and i i noticed of course you know uh for those that don't know, Steve and I used to work together and we uh, have a little bit of background and we, we both have what some might consider a deep knowledge of comics. But you were kind of surprised that I recognized it. I was like, hey, that's a mask homage. It is indeed. Yeah. And, <laughs> you know, Tim, I did this. I did this. I didn't think that that many people would uh, recognize it or know the the uh, tie-in with the the cover but you know what this cover was for me this this yeah. one was my baby I, I wanted to do this one just because I loved uh, the cover so much and LB Cole man Steve you said that exactly right and let me tell you why when doing uh, creative endeavors the best path by the way this is one man's opinion uh, your mileage may vary I always say to start with the things that you love. And I think very often we tend to worry about, well, will customers like this or will they like this type of thing? But the answer is, if you love it, the right type of customer will find you. I agree. Yeah. So uh, I, I was I really agree. thrilled to see that you had, had done the mask homage because incidentally, let's point out, this is one that is not commonly homaged. No, no. I, don't, I, I looked, I, I, I don't remember search ever. and I couldn't find anybody that had ever done it. I, I, I did the same thing, Steve. I don't think it's ever been done. If it has viewers, correct me in the comments. Hey, I, I've never seen one. I'd like to see it. Yeah. But, but so, yeah, uh, Steve, it turns out you're a trendsetter, man. Well, I, I don't know about that, <laughs> Tim. Like, and, and like you just said, uh, I, I, the comic that I'm doing, I'm doing for me. Yeah. Um, I have been uh, asked about taking it to a publisher, but you know what? I don't want somebody telling me what to do with my book. I want to do right. my story. And then if I find right. an audience of people that, that like what I did, but just know that I'm doing it for me. I'm, I'm not trying to please the masses. I'm not trying to do anything else. I'm trying to tell a story that I want to tell that I've been writing for. I've been working on this story for years now, and it's just gotten to the point where I've crafted it and finally put it on paper and putting it on paper is a task. It really is, man. And, and I want to say, uh, Steve, I'm really impressed with you. And the reason is that you've done something that most creators really struggle with. You have finished something. Yeah. Well, uh, I, I, I'm in the home stretch now. It's all done. Um, uh, we're getting the colors finished up right now, but it's, it'll be ready to go to press in just a few weeks. I hope I'm really looking forward to it. Yeah, me too. I, I honestly think when I, when I get the box of, uh, books that are printed and i open them up and pull them out i think i'm gonna cry to him <laughs> yeah uh, you can say that without any embarrassment no to me, I, Steve. I fully fully believe i'm just gonna sob right there on the yeah it's uh and it, that's gonna be step one and i will tell you what step two will be the first time someone comes to you and says i really loved your book steve will you sign it for me yep that that that'll be like kissing your first girl Tim. <laughs> it'll, be, it, well, it'll be on par with the first girl you ever kissed <laughs> well i i hope i'm i'm hope i'm there to see it and man you enjoy that victory yeah so it's, uh it's been a long it's been a long road that's for sure yeah yeah a long and rewarding road yeah so i, I was so. it's a the next one on our list is one of my favorites I'd, I'd like to get a little feedback from you it's one of my all-time favorite artists and this is one that you know we say it's hard to maintain the integrity of these lists and the reason why i say that there are so many great pieces of art out there that it's difficult to compile any kind of meaningful list but i felt like i would be committing an error if i didn't somehow include this man wally wood from 1953 this is our number seven weird science 19 yep i totally agree with you tim uh, just like we, i said earlier if the ec stable of artists there's not a wink link and this might be one of the strongest links they had to be quite Honestly. honest with you yeah, yeah and Wally, how about wally's woods wally woods art is totally it's 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 still good today and he's known for a lot of things. Um, what, what would you say Wally Wood is best known for? You know what I like the most about Wally Wood, other than his amazing figures and amazing gestures, 
the amazing facial gestures. Um, uh, you look at their their face, and you can you can see the emotions. And Bollywood was amazing at that. I mean, but uh, again, Wally Wood was also amazing with architecture and backgrounds. And right, hey right. man, as somebody who's drawn a comic book, I hate drawing backgrounds, but Wally just knocked it out of the park every single time. I think he's great at uh, displaying tension in a one panel scene. Oh yeah. You know, a lot of artists, you know, you need two or three panels to really create tension, but some of these Wally Wood panels, you look at one panel and there's tension in the panel. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, I think that's something he excels at. And by the way, isn't he also, boy, if I've got this wrong, uh, viewers, correct me once more, but Wally Wood's 22 panels that always work, it's a comic oh, yeah. maker's resource. Uh, I, we Absolutely. use that very often because, you know, as creators, Steve, it's easy to get, you know, 50% of the way into a story and you kind of get stumped. How do I portray this visually? And yeah. we often revert back to oh absolutely and, and, and i do tim I, I i do whenever i'm working on something you get stumped and you just go back and okay i'm gonna i'm gonna look at the compositions of the of the people from the artists the great artists from the golden age yeah. and i mean look at the composition of, the, of this work i mean you've got this this uh, figure on the right figure on the left but you've got this this thing that's just drawing you in uh from one uh, from one character to the other and it's just that's composition man and it's they he, wally wood was the master of composition yeah and uh he's uh the original daredevil guy too correct yeah yeah, yeah. And, and where i was gently headed with that you would think that how do i want to say this correctly you would think that having been in the integral stages of designing such a massively popular iconic character that is what he would be primarily known for but here his work was so great that's not even what he's mainly known for i would say he's mainly known as being the science fiction guy with the inventive panels that are unforgettable here 80 years later yeah the thing about wally wood was everything he did he mastered yeah. he could he could do this amazingly well he could do that amazingly well he he man him and jack davis yeah you just can't you just can't beat those guys because <laughs> sure. they they could do anything yeah i love jack davis too man that's, oh, a, that's a great one so as we move forward we're going to get into some of the uh more recognizable uh classic covers i would say and not that we've necessarily picked ones that are obscure but again you and i are collectors so our our knowledge of the subject is maybe a little deeper than some, but number six is still one of my favorites. This is uh, number six, Detective 31. This one's from 1939. That's by Bob Kane. Yeah. And uh, one thing I'd like to mention about this, it's been the subject of a couple of homages, probably most famously by Neil Adams in Batman 27, excuse 227. me, 227. Yeah. And uh, arguable about which one is better, right? Because they're both, just lovely man how can you i mean neil adams just let's just take this and and make it let's put it you know that much higher yeah. set the bar that much higher classic I mean, neil adams is, the first one is a masterful layout absolutely. and the second one is masterful rendering absolutely yeah the he took the composition of the first uh image and just put his own twist on it and made it his own own and uh may have even made it better who knows Right, right. And I have, I should uh, give my own shout out here. Of course, I have an homage cover to that one too. You can probably see it over my shoulder there, which is our Hunchback book. Uh, our, our variant cover was the, uh, yeah. was the, the you know, the, the Detective 31. You can't go wrong doing a, an homage to, to this cover because, man. Well, in the work of the greats, right? It lives oh, yeah. on. And, you know, it's almost impossible to say this book's almost 90 years old. And here we yeah. are still talking about it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I always say to myself, if I had the opportunity to talk to some of these creators back in the day, you almost want to ask them, right? Like, would you have believed that 90 years later, people would still be referencing this work because of how classic it is? And I don't think they would have thought so, because, of course, comics were always kind of designed to be a throwaway medium let's be honest and it was yeah. what some might consider the bottom rung of entertainment well they were they were cheap entertainment for kids yeah basically but here we, you move into modern times and it would be fair to say that it's 
you know, the, one of the touchstones of modern cultural experience, you know, oh, you wow. got the MCU and the, you know, the DC universe and, uh, you know, the theme parks, it's, it, it kind of boggles the mind. Nothing else was really like that. Like, you know, music lived that long and even hundreds of years, but it's never penetrated these other areas of media the way that comics have. Yeah, I agree. Comics have just become a cultural phenomenon. They yeah. have. Uh, and speak, it's good. So what are your thoughts? Speaking of the DC universe, what's your uh, thoughts on the current state of the DC universe? Do you like any of the new shows? Honestly, I, I think the DC universe is getting better and the Marvel universe is getting worse. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'd agree from, with you. From a quality point of view, I think so. Yeah, I would agree with you. And that's uh, and one quick thing I always remind the viewers, hey, we talk about the things we love. We're not going to rag on anybody. No, that's not I, what we do. But exactly. I really loved the uh, the latest, uh, like some people didn't really like the latest Batman that was the Robert Pattinson Batman. I kind of dug it, man. And I liked where they went with the, you know, he was really more like a detective and the Riddler was kind of like this disturbed serial killer. I, I felt that all the pieces worked. Yeah, uh, that that movie uh took me I, I was not expecting it i mean it really yeah. did it really did kind of put a new spin on the batman story and, and it, it was it good. felt like an issue of it felt like an arc of detective comics to me absolutely absolutely yeah. and i mean even the the, the uh, joker movie they made it was a darker grittier take and it was totally different and Dude, I loved it. I, I, loved I love it. that movie too. Yeah. So, yeah. By the way, I'm, I'm sort of pre-wired to like those kind of movies. So <laughs> you, know, you, you, you can take that as you will, but I thought they were both great. No, I did too. I did too, Tim. Speaking of crime, Steve, I saved one of the classics here for you. This is number five, Crime Suspense Stories 22 from 1954. That's Johnny Craig. Yep. Johnny Craig is easily in my top five artist ever this guy just came to the he came to the table with the with the knife and fork every time he put on the <laughs> cover man this guy just knocked it out of the park and and i mean the the total like we were talking about the uh the the comics code yeah. being being just a result of ec comics it might have just been a result of johnny craig because this guy man <laughs> he just cut a lady's head off on this cover yeah yeah Let, let's take a second and talk about this so this is what they call the classic decapitation cover and probably the most infamous of the pre-code horror covers by the way there's a lot of them like you oh, said yeah. we could for our next list, maybe we'll make one based on just that. Oh, but yeah, yeah the, the decapitated head, right? It was almost like they're – picture yourself being a parent, okay, in, <laughs> in 1954, and your kid, you know, stumbling home from his paper route, and he's got this book in his back pocket. Look, I love horror movies and all that kind of stuff, but I probably would have been outraged. Would you? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, that man, that's such a great cover. And I, I don't know how parents could have uh, could have uh, coped with their seven year old <laughs> walking <laughs> home with, with this comic book. Yeah, you know, you, you like to think that you would have been, you know, uh, looking at it from the kid's point of view. It was cool. But from the parent's point of view, I got kids. Yeah, probably not. <laughs> right, right. And, you know, I guess the real disconnect there is that. Uh, Comics were primarily a medium aimed at children, with a few exceptions. You know, you had your romance comics and your uh, classics, that kind of thing. But the EC stories were squarely not aimed at children. And I, I think that they had sort of created their own brand. And it, it, please excuse the phrase, sort of created a monster, if you will. Absolutely. Th that once they became known for kind of this, what I would call shocking content, that you know they had to keep one upping it right yeah and it's oh like, yeah you look, yeah you look through those old covers and you're like oh my god these guys are <laughs> <laughs> you know i mean they were they were trying to knock the ball out of the park every time and but what's even better tim is if you open up the cover and look inside those books man kids shouldn't have been reading that stuff <laughs> right right yeah it, it was very adult and i will say too that um and i, I want i want to hear your opinion as well um these were definitely an influence on my work and in this case here's what i mean by that that uh w one or two of the things that they were kind of known for they always had the twist ending many of them oh yeah what i call a twist ending and number two 
you always had sort of a transformation of the character, either where the good guy became bad or the bad guy became good or somebody getting their comeuppance, that kind of thing. Oh, yeah. And um, those are elements that when I write the stories, I try to put that in there because I think that, you know, the the character arc is more interesting if there's a transformation at the end or most of my stories have some some twist ending. Well, that's just basic, good, basic storytelling. Storytelling, tip. yeah. And that's that's the way it should be. Uh, a lot of stuff uh, lately is ju- it seems like it's just let's put a uh, ending in it that the shocking but there was no seed planted at the very beginning of the story you've got to plant a seed and let that tree grow and then harvest the fruit off the tree you can't you can't put a spin inning at at the end if there was no you know right you 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 can't have a big battle and your sister comes in at the end and saves you you didn't even talk about your sister in the whole rest of the movie you know totally agree totally agree and it's one of the reasons i think why the ec material holds up well because it's kind of known for the shocking covers but speaking frankly the stories are great the stories are amazing the stories are the best yeah they've held up very well even after all this time absolutely In, in many ways better than contemporary horror films hey man no, yeah, no get, arguments don't get, here <laughs> don't get me started on that. that that's a whole other topic that's a whole yeah, other topic that's another video <laughs> so we we sort of briefly touched on the mcu and I, i'm a fan um i feel that i'm lucky lucky to be alive in a time when we see all these classics being brought to the big screen so let's take a second here and focus on number four captain america one it's from 1940 by jack kirby And Jack Kirby, that man was a machine. Jack Kirby, I I think in his, in his prime was doing three or four books a month. And I can't even imagine. Yeah. I can't imagine doing one book a month, Tim. (laughs) Yeah. You know, I will tell you that, well, well, first, you know, we talk about maintaining the integrity of the list. We had to have Jack Kirby on here. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, so just even just have a conversation about him. But we talked about Wally Wood being the master of uh, tension in the panel. Uh, Jack Kirby was the what I call the master of the kinetic panel. Like there's so much action. Many people would need three or four panels to convey the action that he would have in one panel. Yep, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I mean, look what's going on in this cover. There's so many different things. I mean, there's so many different things. And... I just don't understand how this guy could do this every, every single time. I mean, he was a ma- he was a machine. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, there's a lot of uh, controversy. I don't know if controversy is the right word, but you know, he and Stanley had all these great uh, creations together. And sometimes people say things like, yeah, well, Jack Kirby didn't get his due or, you know, like as if Stan Lee kind of hogged the spotlight, if you understand what I'm saying. But I'm not 100% sure that's the case. And here's why I say that. Anytime you ask any comic fan about Jack Kirby, they always say, oh, he's the man. He's the. So I feel that it took time. But I think now Jack Kirby has his place in the pantheon of the comic gods, as it were. And well, I, maybe... I think he always did, Tim, uh, yeah. as far as the comic fans. I mean, back in the back in the 70s and 80s, man, everybody loved Kirby. Yeah, and I'm always kind of surprised by when they say that as if Stan kind of took something from Jack. And I, I think as many people, I think if people know Stan, they know Jack. Yeah, I tr- I think so too. Stan's, Stan and Jack were totally different personalities though. And Stan was the carnival barker. Mm-hmm. You put him in front of a group of fans, man, and you could listen to him tell stories. And I think Jack, Jack, he was just a different personality. He was the guy behind the scenes. Yeah, he re- he was. Yeah. And, you know, I think that this is maybe something you and I could discuss, but I think you need that in a, uh, creative, absolutely. a creative team. Like absolutely. I have. Now, in your case, Steve, look, you're going to have your hands full, man, because you're the, to use a phrase, you're wearing all the hats. Yeah, well, you know, Tim, I, I wanted it done my way, and the only person who can do it my way is me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure, I get you, I get you. And uh, it, it's something I definitely respect. You know, I, I've been a writer for a number of years, and, you know, I think I mentioned to you, I never got any traction until I started having the stories illustrated. Yeah. And uh, almost right away, people started going, what's this, what's this? And so I dived in with both feet but yeah. you know the the things that i find challenging and maybe a month from now i'd like to ask you about your experiences again 
which is the experiences of Kickstarter and uh, with, in particular, social media. It's almost a full-time job every day to do just that. And I want to get to a level where it's not just, like, I'm always concerned about it taking the time away from me writing my next story, you know, and, you know, some, this last one, I think there was something like, you know, you you got something like four or five, six social media posts every day across four platforms. Of course, the YouTube channel, it, it starts to, starts to snowball on you you know yeah and i mean and going let's tie this back into kirby and stan lee stan lee was the uh stan lee was the facebook promotion and jack kirby was the guy behind yeah. the scenes making the making the stuff happen well and you know it's a good point that maybe none of it would have happened if it wouldn't have been for stan lee being the barker because i agree yeah it's by the way, I'm not taking anything away from Stan Lee's stories here. Don't hear that I'm doing that because the stories, I think we can all agree, were fantastic. That's oh, absolutely. Why they, they've absolutely. gone as long as they as long as they have. But it would be easy for those stories to get lost in the comic market without somebody champion, championing the cause. You know what I mean? He was kind of, as you said, being the carnival barker and kind of announcing them to everybody. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I think I think that everybody played their part and they made – I don't think you could have had what you have without one of those pieces being missing. Yeah. Uh, kind of like what they call, you know, catching lightning in a bottle. Yeah. They did it. Yeah, I agree. So speaking of Marvel comics, you know, we're starting to move up to the iconic ones that just about everybody will recognize. This is one of my all time favorites. And um, I'd like to hear your thoughts on this one. That's number three, Marvel comics one from 1939. That's Frank Paul is the artist, by the way. Yep. Yep. Yeah, this is this is where Marvel started. I mean, this is the first Marvel comic. This is this is the uh, foundation, and all everything that came after it has been laying on. Um, you've got the Human Torch on the cover, and uh, that was I, I I don't know about the uh, thought process that went behind uh, making a guy catch on fire and being the superhero, but you know what? It worked, and it was pretty cool. Yeah, and the first one, he's an android, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, he's an android in, in these older older stories, for sure. Yeah, and uh, I will tell you, I was always a fan of the Human Torch. Now, by the way, my first exposure, you know, I'm not that old. I, of course, wouldn't have known about this book, but it, when the characters were sort of rebooted, I guess you'd call it, in the Fantastic Four by Stan Lee again, which, you know, they had the characters like the Human Torch, the Submariner, you know, the, the, when they came around the second time, I was enraptured by them and that's when I started to seek the material out and that's how I learned about this. Oh yeah. Yeah. The, yeah. This is, and I don't know if you know this, Tim, this might've been one of the very first variant covered books. This book has two versions. One is an October cover and one is a November cover. And if you look at the top right corner of the book, there is a little black dot and then there's a November printed over it. On the October version, the November is gone and the black dot's gone, and you can see a white October underneath. Oh. The, yeah, and October is a harder to find book. And I think what happened was back in the day, whenever they printed comics, um, a comic would come out, let's say in uh, January, and they would put a March date on it, and that date was to for for the uh, news stand and know when to take that cover or those books off mm. the newsstand so you had they wanted a three-month window for p- books to be on it two to three months and i think that the production of marvel comics one may have lingered too long and they originally had it scheduled to be an october book and uh by the time it started getting produced they stopped the production and changed huh. it to where they put a November cover or put a November date on it. That way it could be on the uh, stands for another month because they might've been late. Interesting. I, I didn't know that one. <clears throat> yeah. Hmm. Yeah. And I thought you were going to mention, it was also has a very cool homage. I think it's Alex Ross did it for, is it Marvel's? Oh yeah. In the nineties. And that's one of my favorites. I'm a, again, enough fodder for another list. I'm a huge oh, yeah. Alex Ross fan as well. Right. But that, that was one of the ones where I, I guess it's, it's not really quite an homage, is it? But it's, it, it's sort of, no. you know what book I'm referring to? It uh, is. Yeah, I do. I do. Yeah. And, and man, Alex Ross, what a great artist. He, he can render like 
nobody's business <laughs> yeah have you ever seen that it's kind of like a meme is what it is and it shows one of his drawings that he did when he was seven years old and it's superman going like this and it's oh yeah a very rudimentary superman and then oh, it yeah. shows the one that he's done now and it's one that'll make your eyes pop and anyway, oh, yeah. underneath it it says keep going <laughs> <laughs> hey you know the only way to get better at something is to keep doing it yeah you'll, ne yeah. you'll never came you never come out of the box uh, fully, fully, uh, honed. You've got to work on it and polish it. And it takes a long time. It well, does. and speaking for you and I, as comic creators, it's something that, uh, and, and I think you're going to experience this to be the case, Steve, you make the first one and it's a very powerful drug and it, the, all it essentially does is to propel you toward making the next one. Oh, absolutely. And, and pretty soon you're building your brand and you've got your series and you know, I, I look forward to what you're going to make with great anticipation. I think it's going to be terrific. Well, I appreciate that, Tim. Yeah. So uh, moving on, we're coming to the biggies here, Steve. Yep. So we got number two, Detective 27. Man, probably the most expensive and most valuable comic in the world. I mean, yeah. this, there's uh, they're they're hard to they're hard to find in high grade. They're hard to find unrestored, and. Uh, this is where Batman started. I mean, it's not the first big DC book, um, but I mean, it, it might be the most valuable. The, the the Batman and the condition and the uh, scarcity of this book just make it worth yeah. millions of dollars. And it is one of the rarer books too. We yeah. sometimes chat about how some of these books have what I call a, uh, it's more of a market driven value than a scarcity value because- yeah. As you know, sometimes the books aren't necessarily that rare. And, uh, you know, I, I've worked a little bit in the collectibles field, as you have as well. We both have some background there. And uh, like a good example is for not to get too far off the point, but, you know, for the action figures, that's a very big push right now for what they call graded action figures. And currently coming to market, they have what they call prototypes of these uh, 1970s Star Wars action figures. And they do what you and I would consider this, you know, impossible money, two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars $300,000 pretty yeah. regularly. But then, you know, they look into it. Well, how many of these could there be, you know, floating around out there? And the number's in the upper 300s. Yeah. And uh, look, I'm not telling anybody what to collect. Of course, again, this, you know, everybody do your thing, man. Enjoy your hobby. But, you know, I think all of us agree if there's 300 and some of something, it's not that rare. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Now, when you talk about your upper grade Detective 27s, Unrestored, man. that's a rare book. How many do you think are floating around? Psh, out there? I couldn't even guess, Tim. I, I don't know. I haven't kept up with the, the market on them. Uh, uh, I just know that they don't come up very often. They right. don't. Right. And, and by the way, if you when you find yeah. one, it's news. It's a media oh, absolutely. event. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, at this stage, it's unlikely to come across one in high condition, which is yeah. which is really what you're fishing for. I mean, honestly, I, I, I you only hear about one uh, any in any condition, maybe one or two a year selling. I mean, it's right, the, right. If you've got if the people who have them are going to go to their grave with them, I'm, you know, yeah. they're, they're not in any hurry to sell them. Let me ask you this question. You brought up a good point there. And I, I always like to hear about your knowledge from the collectible business too. You know, we used to uh, use this phrase that it's a little bit like the turning of a wheel. And here's what I mean by the turning of a wheel. You know, uh, I, I used to work for an auction house also, as you may know, and we would see certain products as the consumers would grow older and they would start to pass away that what they collected would sort of drop off the radar a little bit as the next generation took the torch and yeah. here's a, one or two examples of that you know we, they were very big on uh, uh like roy rogers and uh gene autry western material and on yeah. the science fiction end it would be things like buck rogers mm -hmm. and to a lesser extent i would include tarzan in that category and they would just command these impossible numbers right but then you you would see the wheel kind of turn and then what it became was you know your your silver age material silver age comics and things like that as the next generation of collectors kind of took the torch so you know what's your thoughts on the wheel turning for the golden age comics do you think we will see a decrease in value or will they maintain and even increase man i hope that they start getting affordable i'll just say that <laughs> you know tim that's a good question uh i think that as they get older there's characters that um 
maybe less uh, in the limelight. You know, I mean, like the the, the Captain Marvel Shazam books mm. from the Golden Age really, you know, they were starting to wane. They were starting to get, you know, less and less desirable because nobody right. had really done anything with him in a long time. And then all of a sudden, boom, they put this movie out. And now we've got a lot more tension on him. Right, right. And it starts to pick back up. So, I mean, I don't know if you saw the uh, the uh, Black Adam movie. A few I didn't see ago. it yet. Man. It good? Oh, I loved it so much. Oh, I got to check it out. Yeah. I did like, uh, I liked uh, the Shazam movie that was, oh, what's that, five years ago? The, yeah. I, I did too, Tim. I thought that was a great movie. That's one of, I, that was one of my favorite DC movies. But, man uh the, the black adam movie well and i love the rock too oh, I, I do too I, I think he's awesome and, he is uh, such a great guy and, and, and now let me ask you and, and don't spoil anything for the movie no. for those that haven't seen it but uh, how does he play it is because you know he's kind of a little bit of a comedic guy too i find is it like a serious role or more is it lean towards comedy a little of both there's really no comedy there man he, mm. he's 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 i mean it, it, it's a lot more serious and uh he, he's he's coming at it from a point of view where he doesn't understand comedy i think is what it is i'm not going to say there's no com comedic value there there is but it's from a uh, point of view of someone who is very naive to the comedy okay. of this century i guess is what gotcha. i'm trying to say gotcha okay well, I'll look forward to that. I'll check that out too. Man, That's, such a good movie. I can't, can't can't recommend that one any higher. That's I, great. I, I love superhero movies, and it's kind of like it was funny. We had mentioned about the turning of the wheel, and yeah. I, I do think there's a turning of the wheel with both DC and Marvel. Yeah, I, I always use the example, and and keep in mind, uh, people probably sense I'm a pretty optimistic fellow. I'm a positive guy. I don't say the things I hate. I try to focus on what I love, but I have noticed that the Marvel movies man they were just fantastic phase one two and three and then now as we're moving into this last phase you're kind of backing into some less known and less interesting characters i feel like you know this isn't uh again what does one man know but like the eternals okay you know yeah Ant man three you know yeah it's 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 not it's difficult to carry the impact of an iron man one a captain america one your at characters a tier characters and i always use the example of uh are you a western fan at all oh yeah yeah, yeah. me too i'm a huge western fan and it was kind of like in the you know in this in the mid to late 60s they had the spaghetti westerns and Studios started churning out Westerns like nobody's business. Hey, the Western's never going to fail. It's never going to fail. And eventually, audiences reached kind of a, what I call a saturation point. They couldn't absorb any more yeah. Westerns. And yeah. I, I have a concern. I, I don't want to get to the level where they say, okay, well, this is, you know, movie 37 or whatever of the series. And what you get is sort of a decline in quality and I, I would hate to see the phenomenon go away, I guess, is what I would yeah, say. Yeah, I agree. I agree, Tim. I, I, I hope it keeps going because I, I like seeing these uh, characters in this genre that I love so much. I like right. I like seeing the movies. Yeah, uh, there are obviously better ones and there's less better, uh, less uh, good ones. But uh, Marvel, like we were talking, just had magic with uh, their phase one two and three right. i mean and you were talking about lesser known characters now they took guardians of the galaxy that nobody cared about and made it awesome. a hit yeah by, by the way that was one of the greats wasn't yeah, it yeah yeah i have such a good show this is the subject for another list as well but i'm a firm believer in that music lends an element to a project oh, that absolutely. wouldn't have achieved any other way so you know we put theme songs with our books that we make and i'm always oh. i'm always kind of hoping for lightning to strike there so hey man nothing that music is uh, uh the thing that makes the world go around yeah 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 i mean by the way mental note save that one for the next list <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, you know, I will say that, you know, as the movies have progressed, and, and this, I mean, particularly DC movies lately, seems like they're getting better. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, specifically, and, and I'll, I'll rewind a little bit. And even some of the ones that people hated on, I kind of dug. I loved uh, The Man of Steel. with. Uh, oh, absolutely. I did, too. 
Hen- Henry I, I love I love Henry Cavill as Superman. He, I, I thought he was terrific. I thought nobody could replace uh, George, uh, not George Reeves, Christopher oh Reeve. Gosh, Christopher Reeve. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but man, Henry Cavill, I just I think he is Superman. And, and how about uh, the people seem to ready to pile on Ben Affleck as Batman? I liked his version too. Did well, you like that one? Yeah, I mean, I didn't. I think Ben Affleck plays Ben Affleck and everything. And I, I, I have a hard time pulling Ben, ben Affleck out of everything he plays. And I, I don't think it's his fault. I think it's mine. <laughs> yeah. I, I think I, I'm a little bit biased there because the part that I liked, it was a little bit more based on the Dark Knight Returns version of Batman, yeah. which that's one of my yeah. favorite versions. Yeah. You know, he had the suit to fight Superman oh, yeah. with and that yeah. kind of thing. So I thought that was pretty cool. And like I said, I, I also enjoyed uh, the most – uh, current version you know the the robert pattinson version so oh, yeah. i i think that uh it seems like they've learned a lesson over there it's, it's warner brothers right they learned a lesson yeah. over there at warner brothers which is let's stop worrying about trying to shoehorn everything into a universe and start working on a better movie oh i and i think they have i think they have yeah yeah i enjoyed the last couple for sure yeah. So, uh, hey, speaking of DC, uh, we got to go right to the cherry on the top of this pie, which is number one, Action One from 1938. Starring Henry Cavill. As Superman. <laughs> you could actually, you could picture him on this cover. Man, so this is the iconic cover. This is where comicdom kind of just bloomed and, and blossomed. This is, this is the, this is the cherry on top, Tim. Yeah, it really is. It really is. Do you, do you have one of these in your collection, Steve? <laughs> yeah, I've got three of these. <laughs> the dog's reading one right now. <laughs> yeah, right, right. I certainly don't have one, but I, I will tell you, and I think you might find this a little interesting, how I was exposed to these early Batman and Superman comics. Because even at a young age, you, you know, in those days, it was still, gosh, you know, it had been a couple of hundred bucks, but to a, a kid that was seven, eight, nine years old, that may as well have been a hundred thousand dollars my parents for christmas one year had gotten me a collected set uh what you you would call a trade nowadays and it was two hard covers and it was uh i'm pretty sure it was uh with the ford written by e nelson bridwell and it it was called batman from the 30s to the 70s and superman from the 30s to the 70s it, it was a thick book each one was like that wow and of course uh what it was it was hey it was like a 40 year retrospective on the history of batman and superman each book and you'd open it up and there was a like a color it was black and white reprints is what it was but in the center section it had color reprints of all the covers and there was one or two uh shorts short stories that were reprinted in color on glossy paper Mm -hmm. and i had been snooping through their bedroom looking for my christmas present i think i might have been seven and i went under the bed and here was these two books just chock full of Batman and Superman stories. And I can remember sneaking up there every day and going under their bed. And I had both books read the whole way through by the time Christmas came. (laughs) But for me, that was the first time that I had seen Detective 27, which was in there. And the first time I had seen Action One. It was was the first time I read the words, faster than a speeding bullet. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. So it it sticks with me. Mine was the uh, the treasuries that came out in the seventies. Mm. Yeah, I had the treasuries of the action and the and the Tech Twenty Seven. Yeah, you mean the oversized ones? Oh yeah, were, they, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Tim, there's nothing greater to an eight year old kid than having a comic book that you have to hold like this. <laughs> that's this big. There's nothing greater than oh, I love Treasury so much when I was a kid. Yeah, I, I still do, and uh, yeah, unfortunately, I, I've lost mine through the passage of time. I used to be a retailer for a little bit. I think maybe you remember that I had a comic yeah. book store and I I retailed mine, but yeah. uh, one of mine, and I will tell you, this is one of my formative experiences as well. You're going to remember it in two seconds. It was Spider-Man versus Superman. And it was, remember they, the covers they were fighting, I think it was atop the Empire State Building or something, but mm-hmm. it was the mm-hmm. first giant sized treasure. Oh, yeah. Man, I was just captivated by that thing. Oh, yeah. I, I couldn't put it down for two days. And you could build a very strong argument that the reason why I got into comics is because of that book. <laughs> it could be. Yeah. Yeah. Could be. Yeah. That's the treasuries, man. They, they, those bring back such good memories from when I was a kid. Just, a, a kid with a giant comic book that's that's fantastic 
Yeah, that, that's good stuff, man. And I, I think that, you know, when we look at this list comprehensively, I mean, you would say that uh, many of these have influenced your work? Oh, absolutely. As a matter of fact, uh, Action One, I have a variant cover for my first comic from Action One, and uh, that's just because the, this this is such an iconic cover. This is such an iconic piece of the comic book history. Yeah, and such a rich and varied history too. There's so much. Like the deeper you dive, the more gold is in there. It's, oh, it's absolutely. It, you know, like like you and I were saying, it's so difficult to come up with the what's the right way so difficult to maintain the integrity of these lists because there's so much good stuff and we want to have a little bit of both where some is things that everyone will recognize and i think if you look through this list there's maybe one or two that people didn't know very well and like i'm fond of saying if you have a chance go check some of these out if you're not familiar with them you know go check out some of the early ec trades go go check out some of the pre-code horror books and see what you think see if you can determine why it influenced Steve's book. And while you're doing that, go and take a look at his new Kickstarter for the new book, Ripped. So Ripped. tell us a little bit, Steve, about where we can find you. Well, uh, it just my Kickstarter launched yesterday for uh, for Rip number one. Um, I've been working on this book. I, the idea for this story started probably, I don't know, 12 years ago or so. I've been sitting on this idea that long. I, I'm one of those people, Tim, that will come up with an idea and I write it down. Mm -hmm. And I just keep writing things down and writing things down and writing things down. Um, because if you don't write things down, you will forget them. Mm -hmm. And uh <clears throat> I've just, I'm very meticulous that way. And I've just, I've sat down and compiled all these notes and I wrote a 10 issue story of what I want to do for my comic book and did, you know, an outline for 10 issues. And uh, then I broke it down and started, you know, let's write the first issue. And I started drawing the first issue. And uh, after just, I got about- not, not to interrupt you, but I just want no. to point out, that's really impressive that you're doing the whole thing. Yeah. Um, so just take a second and speak about that. So you're artist, writer, and letterer and yeah. publisher now. Yeah. 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 I've, I've done it. I've done it all. Um, just I, I, because I really, I, I'm, I'm from the, uh, the publishing world. Um, I have a lot of experience in the publishing world. Um, and I, you know, I just kind of know what everybody does. So I thought, Hey, let me just try to do this and see if I could do it myself. I got to the point though, Tim, where uh, I got the book ready and I was like, well, my wife's like, well, go ahead and start coloring it because I could do that too. And I was like, well, do you ever want to see this book finished? <laughs> right, right. So I went out and I found a colorist and the colorist is working on my book now. And that's the only thing I didn't do was be the coloring. Uh, but I launched it on Kickstarter yesterday and it funded in 29 minutes. Congratulations. Yeah. yeah. It looks terrific. And I know you've got a, a ton of backers and I, I saw your pre-launch even did very well. And I just wanted to say, man, it's really a pleasure to speak with you, Steve. And it's great to see you again. I wish you every success with this book. I appreciate that, Tim. And you as well. I mean, uh, several years ago when I heard that Tim Fling was doing comic books, I'm like, go Tim Fling, man. <laughs> Cause you are, you're, you're, you're one of those people in, that I've known that's just tenacious and, and, uh, you 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 are very uh, you're very workmanlike. You, you if you say something, Tim Fling's going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, and and that's the plan. It's it's funny, and and like I say this partly as a joke, but I sincerely hope that this happens to you. If you would have yeah. said to me five years ago that this is how far it would be in five years, I would have said there's there's no way. And what you may find is that Kickstarter sort of gives you a little boot in the pants because what you're going to get, Steve, is people going to start to follow your work and you're yeah. not going to want to let them down. Well, I, that and that's fine. I, I needed that. Yeah. Um, to be honest with you, Tim, I, I did the pre-launch on it and I wasn't, I still had quite a bit to go and I did the pre-launch on it. And I did that just because I needed some pressure to get yeah, it finished. Yep. 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 Exactly. And, and it did, it got me, it got me over the hump and now, now we're, we're rolling. We're ready to print this. Well, comic. and look, I, I'm going to, I know you pretty well too. And I'm going to read your mind. I, I guarantee this is what Steve Ricketts is going to say. You're going to make a little bit of money and you're not going to say, Hey, I'm going to put this in my pocket or go blow it on something. You're going to say, Hey, here's my money for the next arc. 
Yep. Yeah, <laughs> right. Tim, I do in this in the hard reality of this whole thing is that I've been working on issue one for probably two years now. And uh, for the last month and a half, two months that I've been working on issue one, I've been mentally working on issue two. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I'm already writing. I'm already drawing. I've, I've already got scenes and, and everything ready for issue two. Um, but, you know, it, I've, I'm, I'm like, hold on. Okay, I've got to stop this. I've got to go back and I've got to get this finished on issue one. I can't oh. do issue two until we finish issue one. Well, welcome to the club, brother. So, so glad to have you. Thanks, Tim. I appreciate it. So uh, first, I just want to say thanks again for doing the show, Steve. I'm going to put the links here at the bottom, or you can follow the links in our bio if you'd like to follow Steve Ricketts' project. It's on Kickstarter right now. It's called Ripped, and it's highly recommended. I hope to see you over there. Um, Steve, thanks so much for coming on the show today. This was a I, fun I, one. I appreciate it, Tim. Thank you for having me. Uh, my goal in my comic book, number one, is I want everybody to be entertained, and it's going to entertain them. I can promise you that. <laughs> yeah, I, I've seen a preview and I, I want to tell the viewers, I really recommend this book. It's a lot of fun. And uh, also you get a lot of bang for the buck. If you like yeah, variant yeah. covers, he's got those. If you like homage covers, Steve's got those. Um, there's a, you're also doing like a metal foil and a hollow yeah. foil. Yeah, I mean, I offered something for everybody, something for, I mean, if you want to get in and just read the book, you can get it. Uh, you can do the PDF for five bucks. You can read the book. Um, but I've got options for people who want printed books anywhere from a low end to a high end. I, I've kind of tried to give everybody everybody a little option that they would like. And if anybody, like I say, if anybody backs at the digital level of your book for the digital PDF, I'll throw in a free digital copy of mine. So you get two books for the price of one. Awesome. Awesome. That'd be okay. awesome, Tim. I appreciate it. Awesome. Well, Steve, best of luck with your project. Uh, thanks to our viewers for tuning in. And Absolutely. Uh, we'll look forward to seeing you next time. Thanks, Tim. See you, everybody. Bye.